da Universidade da Catânia. Então, esse projeto comum que temos em conjunto, o professor Carante vai explicar um pouquinho para vocês, que chama Kant, na América do Sul, e faz parte de um consórcio entre de pesquisadores de, quatro, de oito universidades, quatro universidades europeias, quatro universidades sul-americanas, e no Brasil, o FMG e Santa Catarina. Então, esse curso do professor Carante abre, é a primeira atividade desse projeto, que é um projeto de cooperação, e que da UFMG fazem parte eu, a professora Georgia, e a professora Virginia. E para nós aí é um grande prazer apresentar o professor Luiz, que é professor, então, ele é um estudioso do Kant, aqui a gente trouxe dois livros importantes do professor Luiz, esse Kant, o escândalo da filosofia, que é uma discussão sobre o ceticismo cartesiano, e esse que é o objeto do curso de vocês, que é o, o, a, o legado político do Kant, e que vocês devem ter recebido esse livro em PDF. Então, a gente vai ter três dias de um curso intenso, né? de, não, não precisa finalizar até uma hora, porque vai depender um pouco do, 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 fôlego. do fôlego, mas teremos então um intervalo no meio, e para dar um break, depois a gente retoma é, as atividades. Mas, Luiz, para nós é um grande prazer te introduzir e te bem-vindos aqui na Universidade. Thank you, thank you very much for coming, and uh, you can begin your. Right. Thank you all for organizing this, for being partners in this project, and thank you for the, the students for the present. I apologize. Uh, I am not able to this. Uh, I'd like to. I love Portuguese. Uh, my friends know that I love Portuguese, and I understand Portuguese because I'm Italian, but I, I'm very bad with active knowledge so far. So uh, I'll have to speak in English. I can receive answer, uh, questions in Portuguese. I think I'll be able to understand them. If you're not comfortable uh, in uh, asking questions in English, that's perfectly okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me thank once again uh, my colleagues Patricia, George and Virginia for organizing this secondment, that's the way it's called uh, in the European language, what I'm doing here within this project, and in particular for organizing this mini course that gives me the opportunity to present to you the things I've been studying lately in my research. Um, and um, what I would like you to receive in general from this course is an introduction to the philosophy of human rights. So you will not become an expert neither in human rights nor in the philosophy of human rights, but you will be introduced to the debate uh, by following this course. That's my goal at least. Let's hope that it, this happens. If you like it uh, uh, and if you want to go deeper, uh, I am at your disposal. I mean, I'm always reachable through email, even if I'm not around. Uh, if you want to read more, if you want to go deeper in some of the themes that we will be touching on, that's perfectly okay. Just write to me. I'll be happy to share with you new materials, new papers that allow you to focus on one of the problems you might want to focus on. Human rights and violence, human rights and humanitarian interventions, human relationship between human rights and democracy. Is democracy human rights? Is dignity the foundation of human rights? Which is pretty much the only thing we are going to dig a little bit more uh, deeper in this course, among the many. Because as you might know, human rights was not, not a, a, a subfield or the subject of any course until 30 years ago. And it's James Nihil that this philosopher of law still living and active, uh, I think he's at the University of Miami right now, um, who made human rights into a subfield of political philosophy. Um, so it's of course a theme that cuts across different disciplines, obviously law, international law, humanitarian law, but it is through James Nigel, I guess, that this became um, a concern for political philosophers <coughs> in its own right. Right now, there is a huge literature on uh, not only on human rights, but also on the philosophy of human rights. So, uh, it 
is by now an established sub-discipline. Okay, so this is the goal I would like to reach through these three long meetings. <laughs> Let's hope that we will survive. Um, um, but um, uh, before I start uh, with today's uh, introduction to the contemporary debate, I would like to say something more about this project that brought me here and then that will bring your professors to uh, Europe very soon because one of the things that is going to happen soon in this project is this uh, colloquium we'll have in Catania, uh, kind of the contemporary world, uh, all the people involved in the, in the project, in the Cantensa project will be present more or less. So uh, this project, as Patricia already said, um, is uh, an initiative of four European universities, University of Catania that is coordinating the project, London School of Economics, the Martin Luther Universität at Halle Wittenberg and the University of Lisbon, that's the European side, the Southern American side, Campinza, South America, uh, is uh, the two Brazilian universities Patricia already mentioned, and uh, two Argentinian institutions, the CONICET and the University of Buenos Aires. So it's a network of Kant scholars, basically, uh, and uh, the main goal of the project is to, uh, for us Europeans, to learn the way in which Kant is read, studied, interpreted in South America, and perhaps also for uh, South American scholars to know more about what we do right now, the latest developments of Kant scholarship in, uh, um, in uh, Europe. Um, as you may know, I guess you know, uh, the Brazilian scholarship, especially in uh, Cannes, has developed exponentially in the last 20 years. Um, I don't know whether this was planned, uh, it was the result of some political reforms that affected the university at large, but it's certainly the case that the quality, I myself have been coming to Brazil the last 10 years, more or less, maybe more, um, I have noticed a, a, a dramatic increase in the quality of the scholarship. So it is our interest to know more about uh, what our Southern American colleagues do. Um, and also, <coughs> one of the goals of the project is to establish lasting uh, connections between institutions. So we have to make our best effort to have this going also besides the four years that the project is accumulated on. Um, so, um, what else can I say about the project? Uh, you have some more details here. Um, um, one thing I'd like to say is um, that the scheme is at the university for give <coughs> How efficient. I noticed that there was a mistake because there was not the right logo of the Universidad Federal Minas Gerais. This morning, one hour ago, and I sent a message to the web designer said, Look, it's wrong, and it has already been corrected. I'm very glad. Um, so, <coughs> and you don't want to have the wrong logo of the institution to talk. Right? It's only the context, no? It's not the right logo, right but at least it's the right yes. you know, main, main. At first it was the Conicet logo, so, okay. Uh, you give me the logo, because I, I, have, I couldn't find it in the website, uh, so I can give it to the guy who takes care of the website. Okay, so one thing I'd like to say uh, is uh, something about the Marie Curie schemes in general. I don't know how familiar you are with Marie Curie grants. This, uh, project is funded through a Marie Curie RISE. Um, RISE stands for Research and Innovation Staff Exchange. Um, and this scheme is reserved, as the name suggests, for the uh, secondments uh, and therefore the exchange of different scholars, either at the international level, like in this case, international meaning Europe plus the rest of the world, or within Europe. Um, so, 
uh, this is only one of the Medicare grants that one can apply for. There are many Medicare grants for individuals uh, that you could be interested in because one of the common mistakes is to think that Medicare grants are reserved to European citizens. This is not right. Uh, most of them are open also to non Europeans, so it is your interest to look into the many possibilities that the Medicare schemes at large offer. Uh, for example, one of the most common schemes is the so-called, uh, well, so-called, they used to be called, maybe they changed their name, but anyway, it's the intra-European fellowship. It means that it's a scheme that funds individual researchers to go two years and do research in one of the European institutions. Again, this is not reserved to Europeans. So if you want to go and study in Germany, in Italy, in France, in United Kingdom, you have to be quick because they're leaving, as you know. Um, but um, uh, if you want to go to Europe and, and study, this is a scheme that uh, is uh, appealing to you. Uh, it, these are very generous grants. You won't have a common problem for two years. I can assure you of that. Um, and they are competitive, but not incredibly competitive. Let's put it this way. So. The most competitive scheme is the Global Fellowship, that is a fellowship to go from Europe abroad. Uh, and uh, in that case, the 8% of the applications are retained for funding. And this is the most competitive. The intra European one um, is, uh, has a success rate of about 11%. So it is competitive, but it's one out of 10. There are many different schemes that are much more competitive than that. So, I mean, think about it. If you if you are planning to go abroad and study, this could be an opportunity. Uh, I I act as an ambassador for Medicare grants because I chair the Italian chapter of the Medicare Alumni Association. Uh, that is an association of people who have already gotten this degree. Uh, and uh, I have won four <coughs> fellowships in my career, so I think I have rather extensive expertise in telling you how to get one. Um, and uh, so, uh, again, if you are interested in knowing more, I'd be more than happy to share with you details of the different possibilities that you have, and if you decide to apply on how to make the best application to increase your chances of success. Well, um, that's uh, more or less, <coughs> let me show you, ah, so that I can, um, I can say something better about my colleagues here, who have not yet turned in their uh, photo and biography, although they were asked long ago to do so. So, uh, if you don't see their pictures here, uh, it's really their fault. Uh, but that's actually a very small subset of the participants because we are more than 40 scholars in this in this year. So it's a lot of people. Um, am I right? 40, not 30. I exaggerated a little bit. We are around 30. Okay, now I, uh, I think I had opened my Dropbox. Um, let's go to the topic of the, of the course. Uh, I don't know the, the level of your English, so I thought that for the first lecture, which is today, uh, I'm going to read the chapter that I wrote in my book uh, for introducing the contemporary debate on human rights. Um, you have the, the, the PDF, so you can go back any time to it. I'm going to comment a little bit what I wrote so that we don't fall asleep after half an hour because I, I find myself very boring. So <laughs> and reading out loud myself is extremely boring. So I'll try to cheer it up a little bit as much as I can. Um, so, um, but I thought that it was not an extremely bad idea because 
uh, even if you don't, are not strong in English, you will be introduced and you will uh, find easy for you. Um, I hope, given the, the substantial amount of time at our disposal, that you will participate with me in the, in the lecture, which means that you will ask questions, then you will stop me and everything, and you, you will relieve the burden of speaking for three and a half hour. So I count on you. Um, uh, I mean, you can interrupt me anytime while I'm reading and discussing, and uh, I, I'm going to reserve at least one hour, one hour and a half at the end of the class, one hour, let's say, for having a general discussion about what we did. But this is not an alternative to clarificatory question that you may have as I go on reading. Okay? Okay, so, well, before I start reading, let me actually ask you, um, What do you think um, the philosophy of human rights is about? If you have a sort of prejudgment in the in the good sense, a prejudice in the in the good sense of the word, what do we study if we want to do philosophy of human rights? I think it's I don't know. The first impression is that about the foundations of human rights, or something like this. Search for foundations. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, when we talk about the foundation of human rights, what we basically mean is what, the, what is the basis of their normativity. I mean, why do we think that humans have rights just in virtue of their belonging to a species? Um, that's um, clearly an important philosophical question, but it's not the only one that we can have. For example, another important question is, what rights are human rights? Not all rights are human rights, obviously. So which of the many rights one may think uh, we have uh, are human rights? So what is the difference between the rights that a state, even a liberal democracy, gives us and human rights? Are they fewer, more, uh, are different? Um, or um, why do we think that the sovereignty of states stops the moment in which states violate human rights? Uh, and does that make uh, apparent uh, <coughs> a, a possible tension between human rights and democracy? I mean, if a people decides that it's okay to torture terrorists um, uh, for the sake of security, who are we? and we being the international community, uh, to say that they are wrong and that terrorists should not be tortured. Um, so if that is the case, you see that there is already a potential conflict between this idea of democracy understood as, in a very meaningful sense, as the law that the people gives to itself, um, and, uh, and, the, and the culture. So, we are going to focus on the foundation of human rights in this course, but I don't want you to think that the foundational issue is the only issue that we may have uh, when we do philosophy of human rights. Okay, so I'll start here. So, human rights play a crucial role in contemporary politics. That's uh, an evident truth. They are a lingua franca that is a universal language that allows representatives of different worldviews to have a common basis of shared values. They inspire activism around the world and set limits to the sovereignty of states. Notice the first characteristic, this idea of being a universal language. When you do human rights, when you think of human rights, you are not thinking about your own moral perspective, you are not thinking the about a moral perspective that is okay only for a part of the world, but it's supposed to be something that everybody understands, everybody agrees on. And this itself is a philosophical problem, because usually when we do moral theory, we look for the truth. Uh, I mean, at least if you are a Kantian. I mean, um, you look for the truth, you don't care if other people agree. If you think that you hit on the truth, that's all that matters, right? 
Whereas when you do human rights, it's not exactly like that. I mean, you may have your own strong belief in what the moral truth is and believe that human rights should not perfectly overlap with that moral truth because you know that that truth is not going to be accepted by different cultural contexts. So the, another interesting philosophical issue is the relation between truth and human rights. Uh, as you know, with rules, um, even political philosophy and truth went a little bit apart from one another. I mean, political liberalism explicitly says uh, this book is not about the truth in political philosophy, it's about the uh, the best reconstruction that we can give of a, of a certain cultural context and, uh, uh, and uh, spelling out of principles that are in reflective equilibrium with uh, uh, this kind of political culture. But this separation between truth and philosophy is even uh, more evident when you talk about human rights. For the reason that uh, one of the main objections to the whole human rights culture is the fact of which I'm sure you have heard of that human rights tend to be parochial and by parochial we mean that they are okay for the West they are sort of um, you know uh, new instruments of the Western imperialism we go there with this idea of individual rights uh, self-government uh, uh, separation between uh, religion and state, uh, um, women's rights, uh, uh, equality between women and men, uh, equality of religions, and so on and so forth. And this is, you know, just a legacy of the Enlightenment. This is the legacy of uh, the religious wars in Europe. That's how we organize our political life. But why should other uh, parts of the world do the same? Okay, so this idea of being a universal language is uh, a common uh, preoccupation when you do the philosophy of human rights. So the importance of human rights has many reasons, one of which is particularly intriguing. We are intending novelty in the history of human reflection on the universal rules that should govern each and every agent. In fact, no earlier attempt to turn moral claims into norms governing politics even resembles what human rights are doing in our world. Certainly, a tendency towards universal acceptance was built into all major metaphysical and religious worldviews. Think of the universal element built into the very etymology of Catholicism, being Catholic. Catholic means universal. Or of the inborn tendency of all major religions to speak the truth about fundamental matters. Nonetheless, no preceding set of ideas has aspired to become the common normative language of mankind, and that's the novelty, independently of the metaphysical or religious substratum on which it rested. So, in the history of ideas, we already have seen many attempts of speaking the universal truth about morality. But it's the first time that we try, that we see the same attempt run without an appeal to a deep philosophical uh, foundation. Uh, without being committed to a specific metaphysics, to a specific ontology, not to mention to a specific religion. Okay? So that's the novelty. You, we want a universal language, a normative universal language, but we want this language as detached, as independent, as possible of uh, deep metaphysical roots. Hmm? So human rights today are the hope that we can start from very different assumptions about the ultimate truth about morality, life, uh, philosophy, and so on and so forth and still reach common norms to govern the way we should treat each other. Even if our religious, philosophical and moral views vary significantly and have the potential to lead to conflict, we can still resort, in case of deep disagreement, to the language of human rights to find agreement. 
or at any rate a shared basis for dialogue. So that's the importance of human rights. One of the dimensions of the importance of human rights today. By virtue of this ambition, human rights perform the function that made them vital even outside the relatively small circles of academics and politicians. This way, this was imposing a limit on national sovereignty and giving the international community, whatever that is, I never understood exactly what the international community is, authority to intervene in countries' domestic affairs. All major occurrences of political violence after the fall of the Berlin Wall, so from Rwanda to Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Mali, and now again Libya, uh, as, you know, as you know, have been conceptualized in the language of human rights violation, triggering a demand for action by national and international bodies through the intervention of single external states or by a coalition, with or without the endorsement of the UN. Since virtually all states accept the authority of human rights, at least on paper, at least officially, there is no you, you won't hear any head of state today in the world saying, fuck human rights, I don't care about human rights or stuff like that. Human rights are, are just, yeah, there may be a few dictators here. No, 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 I'm not, no, don't get me wrong. Something similar to that. Well, I know that there is you know, this argument uh, that human rights are, uh, have to be balanced against the security of citizens. In, in Rio, right? Didn't they make this argument? But it's very rare, let's put it this way. Independently of what the politicians or, or people in power do to other people, they will never or very rarely officially say, I don't care about human rights or human rights are wrong or stuff like that. So officially, everybody agrees about human rights. No one dares to say, no, no, you know, my race. Is, is more entitled than your race to have rights or just because I'm a man I have more rights than you because you are a woman or stuff like that. Um, so this is an interesting phenomenon that you know, there is no explicit disagreement about human rights uh, in international politics. Um, so these more or less serious forms of interference in domestic affairs by the international community have been in so facto legitimized. So even governments that were barely sincere in their homage to human rights regretted binding themselves to such a strength. <coughs> Once you bind yourself to human rights, then you attract on you possible criticism of other uh, of other states. So vice pay the high price to be issued in those cases. And another feature of human rights is worth mentioning, I think. They limit the right, that's something that I've already mentioned. They limit the right each people has to give laws to itself. Although one hardly hears this point in academic discussions a little bit more now, it should be clear that human rights compete with the dominant value of our times, that is democracy, are not just the other phase of democracy. They are in competition with democracy. They compete with the value of democracy. At least that's the way I see it. And in fact, lately, I mean, in the book that I send you, the, the edited work by Kruf, Liao, Liao and Renzo on human rights, there is a nice discussion the relationship by Christiano on the relationship between human rights and democracy, and myself wrote something about it. Um, so there is uh, now a, a, a more attention to this theme, but it shouldn't be that difficult to see that human rights and, and democracy are not the same thing. Actually, to the extent in which there are external limits to the political will of each people, they tend to be in tension with the value of the moment. Um, so if we take human rights seriously, communities do not have an unlimited right to self-determination. 
they have this right and specific human rights protect just that possibility, but with well-defined limits, not democratically determined. Okay? Okay, so um, given the fundamental rule. Maybe you want to put a chair? So, given the fundamental role human rights play in politics and for the lives of millions of people around the world, it is hardly surprising that not only scholars but also politicians and common citizens still feel the need to reflect on what grounds their normativity. We are going to focus on this foundational question. Now, how have philosophers responded to this burgeoning request for clarification about the foundation of human rights? Whatever arguments have they offered, at least recently, to those who believe in human rights but would like to get a better grasp on the reasons why we have them? They can believe in human rights and do not understand exactly why we have human rights, and it's a legitimate question to get some more clarity on the foundation. More importantly, how did they respond, philosophers, how did philosophers respond to those who are not convinced that human rights should be the ultimate tribunal of what a people can or cannot do? Well, this is more or less the state of the play. I wrote this book one year ago, so it's not that uh, old. I think this, what I'm going to say, still applies to today. Philosophers have reached no unified account, and that's okay because there is no unified account in philosophy as we know. Um, it's not surprising. Uh, what is more worrying is that while the culture of human rights around the world gains momentum, so you know, there, are, there is rising activism, and as I said, there is a widespread consensus on human rights across culture, de facto people agree about human rights, philosophers uh, are not capable of finding an explanation of this increasing agreement about these normative standards. And certainly it is unclear that these improvements have come by virtue of the philosophical work that has been done so far. In other words, it is unclear that any skeptic of human rights has become less skeptical because philosophy has provided a good account of the normative force of these rights. And if you think that philosophy should not change the minds of skeptics around the world, there is nonetheless room to say that philosophy has not even clarified the terms of the discussion. The confusion has reached so high a peak that a leading scholar in the field, James Griffin, has recently felt the need to step back from substantive, substantive questions to reach a meta perspective. So philosophers have started themselves have started asking themselves the question, not what is the foundation of human rights, but what should the foundation of human rights amount to? So in this sense, it's a meta question. Uh, John Tassiulas, who is probably the philosopher today who most professionally talk about human rights, recently published a paper, again, on this meta question. What should the foundation of human rights look like, not what is the foundation of Uh, and so, before Tassilas Griffin asks, what are we philosophers, political theorists, and jurisprudence trying to do when we uh, talk about human rights? Alla Buchanan, another important scholar, recently asked, what is a philosophical theory of human rights? Not to mention Joseph Rass, who has a clear answer, and sim simply thinks that human rights have no foundation, so uh, the answer is straightforward in that case. So the main question about human rights today, uh, from a philosophical perspective at least, is in full force, remains in full force. How do we know that human rights are not simply the invention of well-meaning minds shocked by the brutality of the Second World War, the Holocaust, and the various horrors of the military regimes? Uh, how do we know that they are what the, they promise to be ultimate standards with cross-cultural universal validity, and how do we know whether the list of human rights we have in the main documents, the 
universal declaration, the <coughs> treaties uh, from the 60s and so on is the correct list. Namely, it includes those rights that are to be considered as human rights. Maybe we, we should have a shorter list, and now there is the common example here of a, a human right that many people think should not be a human right. Is it really the case that everyone has a human right to rest and leisure, including holidays with pay, as famously, famously stated by Article 24 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Most people, not everyone, but most people think that human rights are about guaranteeing basic stuff. So the fact that you are not treated, the fact that you are not tortured, the fact that you don't starve, the fact that you count something in the political process of decision making in your political community, but not that you have to have all the big pay. That's nice. Uh, nice and perhaps no. There is a very important. I mean, there is a very serious scholar at Columbia who wrote an article trying to defend the fact that the holiday we pay is a human right, making the argument that if you don't, if you are not allowed ever to go on holiday, your life is quite miserable. Now it's a serious argument, but you know the majority of the people think that. The, the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were a little bit too generous here with Article 24. What? Irrealistic. Irrealistic. A little bit utopian, yes. yes. And what about the human rights to the highest of the risk? This one is even better, I think, and this comes from the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Uh, a uh, human right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental well-being. Um, okay, uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, and what about the less famous case of ambitious rights such as Article 27, first paragraph, again of the Universal Declaration, which reads, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in the scientific advancement, advancement and its benefits. I mean, yes, again, um, how miserable would, would be a life in which I am so poor that I have to work every day, uh, every, you know, 10 hours a day, and I can and I don't have time to uh, share uh, the benefits <coughs> of the arts, of uh, the scientific advancement. You do hear the Universidad na Praza. Actually, I, I read the last title. It was very uh, the, the real as a philosophical question. I like it very much. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, it's important. Uh, it's debatable whether these goods should be made that those protected by human rights. We think they are after more basic stuff. So questions about the proper list and nature of human rights are logically distinct, that's the first point I made today, from the foundational question. So I invite you not to conflict uh, these different questions. Uh, so it's easy to show that they are independent. Let's assume that you have a compelling argument that shows one, that humans have dignity, and B, that they are that humans are entitled to certain rights by virtue of that These results are going to influence what you say about the proper list and nature of human rights, but obviously more philosophical work needs to be done to come up with an account of which rights should be conceived as an essential protection of human dignity and to answer the question about the nature of human rights. So I'm not saying that the answer you have to the question of what is the foundation of human rights is not going to influence the question about what is the proper list of human rights or what is the nature of human rights. Of course it's going to influence, <coughs> but it's more philosophical work needs to be done uh, to move from uh, uh, your idea of what the foundation is to uh, the answers to, dif to these different questions. Again, the foundational answer you adopt is going to impact greatly uh, on uh, the other two questions, uh, and more importantly, though, it enjoys.
enjoys a logical priority over them, why is the foundational question logically prior to the question of the probabilist and to the question of the nature of human rights? Well, in my mind at least, why it is conceivable, as in the example that I gave above, that one cannot with an answer to the foundational question while still remaining uncertain or non-committal with regard to the other two. So you can be certain that dignity is the foundation of human rights, but you can still be uncertain what dignity implies in terms of these are the human rights we need, uh, the nature of human rights is to do this and that, to perform this and that, that, that function, but not others. It's rather difficult to see the other way around. So. Um, it would be bizarre to submit an account of the nature and probabilist of human rights and remain fully silent on uh, uh, why human rights are not the sheer invention of well-meaning minds. So it seems to me that the foundational question has a logical priority because it's hard to, it's difficult to conceive of someone who comes to you and says, oh, I have a great theory of exactly which rights should count as human rights. But you know, I have no idea whatsoever why human rights should be taken seriously. That's quite bizarre. Whereas, um, the other way around sounds more acceptable. I, I have a good philosophical theory about what the foundation of human rights is. And I still don't know for sure what we should infer from this, uh, from this foundation. Okay. Uh, so, both for reason of space and for its logical priority, in what follows, uh, we are going to focus on the foundation of question. And in the remaining, the remaining part of the chapter, I'm going to reconstruct the contemporary foundational debate, highlighting strengths and weaknesses of the three, because there are three main orientations today in the philosophy of human rights, if we focus on this question of the foundation. So, what are these three, uh, these three main orientations? Um, the so-called justification deficit is so acutely felt among philosophers that uh, a voluminous publication devoted to the foundational problem has recently appeared, is the one I gave to you with contribution by the most authoritative scholars. Here the different accounts are divided into three main groups that are that by and large overlap an earlier partition offered by John Masulas in productive, orthodox and political views. Uh, we now have in the language of this new book uh, instrumental justification that correspond to the reductive category of Tazulas non-instrumental justification that correspond to the orthodox category uh, of, of the Zulas, and practice-based justification which correspond to the political view. I'm going to explain why. Let us introduce the essential of these three approaches with a few critical notes that should suffice to explain why, in my modest opinion at least, none of them provides a convincing foundation. That's also why you want to write a book about human rights, because you are not satisfied with what's already out there. Um, okay, so that's really the center of today's class. I want you to be crystal clear on what these three different orientations are. Okay, so uh, in terms of in sheer information that I'm passing to you, that's uh, what you should get from today's class. Okay, what is an instrumental, instrumentalist approach to human rights? Instrumentalists, let's call them this way, think of human rights as useful means to realize certain features of human lives that are taken as self-evidently valuable and worthy of protection. So everybody have, has a pretty good idea of what it's important to have a good life Human rights are simply the things that protect these things that we need to have an acceptable, if not good, or very good life. 
So instrumentalism in the sense that human rights are instruments for having a decent or good life. Okay? When it comes to specifying though what these features are, three different answers are suggested within instrumentalism. Something that it's agency, the feature in question, it's agency what makes our life worthy, what makes our life acceptable. Why agency? What's so important about agency? Well, the idea that unless it's you who steers the life you have, uh, nothing has value. I mean, very intuitively, uh, it's always up to you to decide that uh, you enjoy freedom, that you enjoy uh, certain material goods, but it has to be through your choice, your ability to um, uh, choose these goods uh, that confers on them the value that uh, we think they have. So others though, other instrumentalists deny that there is one single good that is the basis of uh, human rights and opt for a plurality of goods uh, central to human life. Thirdly, the capability approach that you know uh, developed by Sam and Nussbaum insists on human rights point of securing what they call capabilities. Capabilities are, are not material goods but are real opportunities for individuals to realize certain functions. So notice, capabilities are halfway between material goods and sheer freedom. They are real opportunities. What is the bridge? The bridge is that Sen and Nussbaum think that uh, the quality of a political system has to be measured in terms of how many capabilities it offers to people who live there. And capabilities are real opportunities to do what you think is important for you. So it's not just having the abstract freedom to go to the university, but also to have the real possibility to go to the university. Uh, yeah, just to give the most obvious example, so in this sense there are uh, halfway between material goods and, uh, and freedoms. Um, so Mental and bodily health um, uh, is another uh, is another example. Uh, in order to have uh, a mental and, and bodily uh, healthy life, you you don't need merely uh, the possibility of not eating junk food, but you also need to have the possibility of buying of having the resources of, of buying good food in order to have. Uh, a mental and healthy good life. So, uh, within instrumentalists, you find these this three different main approaches. One focused on agency, one that we co could call pluralist, and the other one is the capability approach. Now, let's see something more about each of them. Agency, uh, so the capacity to act on chosen, self-chosen, self-picked, self-imposed ends is both something that you must tend to value highly in itself and something that distinguishes us from uh, uh, other animal species because one of the many things we need to do when we do philosophy of human rights is to show and prove that we are entitled to assign to ourselves rights that we are not ready we think is right not to give to animals. Uh, what are human rights specifics to use Peter Singer's famous category? I mean, are, are we racist against other species? We could say in uh, claiming human rights and saying we are, you know, we are entitled to these rights, in, but we don't think that dogs, monkeys, uh, cats uh, are. So we need a, an answer to that. Um, so, agency usually is what is uh, offered as an answer, among other things, uh, to uh, explain why we are entitled to uh, have a special treatment for humans uh, compared to other species. Why? Because usually people think that the amount of uh, self-control that we have in our lives 
that's the way in which it's usually framed, that the issue is much higher, if not completely absent, much higher than in other species where some people think is completely absent, some other thing is developed to a considerably lesser degree. Okay, so the most authoritative exponent of this orientation, that the one that focuses on agency, is James Griffin, who wrote in 2008 this on human rights that had uh, a huge impact uh, on the discipline. Now, Griffin thinks that human rights protect human dignity by affording humans the means necessary to exercise their capacity for agency. So, the argument is quite straightforward. <coughs> human rights protect the instruments we need in order to steer our lives according to our choices. Uh, we are not agent unless we are given these goods that human rights protect. Uh, and since agency is the most important value, human rights ipso facto are justified because they protect what is most important. Very nice, no? Except that it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, because no matter how appealing agency-based justifications of human rights, they encounter serious difficulties. The major problem, which was already noticed by Vento back in 1984 in a different debate against uh, G. Wirth, who proposed in the same year an argument similar to the one offered by Griffin, uh, it was a sort of transcendental argument uh, in favor of human rights. He, he proposed this transcendental argument that says, basically, uh, you cannot help considering yourself an agent, but if you cannot help considering yourself an agent, then you have to endorse the means that allow you to be an agent. Therefore, you cannot refuse uh, the normativity of uh, rights that secure you the things that make you an agent. So it's a transcendental argument because basically human rights are not to be the conditions of the possibility of being what you cannot deny to be an agent. So that was Gilbert's answer. That is a little bit different than Griffin, but quite similar in the end. So what is the problem with this transcendental argument in its various forms? Well, even slaves have agency. Even slaves remain agents. Um, and they have to be agents also at a certain degree of <coughs> development and reached by some education and skills, otherwise they would be worthless. You don't want to have a slave that is a robot. You want to be able to give orders to a slave, otherwise he's useless. Order means do that, and he understands and performs that duty of efficiently. In order to, that, to do that, he has to be an agent. He remains an agent, even if he is in a condition of slavery. So protecting agency is compatible with allowing slavery. If there is something that is clear, is that slavery is a violation of human rights. So if you focus on agency, you end up with this kind of counterintuitive um, uh, consequences. So obviously slaves have their human rights violated, Hence, agency cannot be the foundation of human rights. Now, of course, it, Griffin is aware of this uh, uh, criticism, criticism, and he says, oh, wait a minute, but by agency, I don't mean that the agency that a slave has. I mean something better than that, more you know, expanded. Uh, I am talking about my agency, if not my agency as a professor at Oxford, at least, uh, the agency of a normal person uh, who does a normal life. Uh, the problem with that is that um, uh, it becomes very difficult to set the limits of the goods you need in order to have this minimally good life. So you have a little bit of the threshold, what is called the threshold objections. Where exactly do you draw the line below this amount of goods you are violating human rights above this amount of goods human rights are not violated. And so, if you, 
if you speak literally about agency as the center of human rights, you have the slave problem. Uh, so it's, it's easy to conceive of agency. Uh, I mean, if you are given uh, some mentally impairing um, medicine, you are no longer an agent because you, your brain no longer controls your body. So it's easy to understand when you stop to be an agent. But, of course, human rights cannot be just the protection against medicine that makes you stupid or makes you unable to control your body. That you need more than that. I mean, clearly human rights protect more than, you know, uh, protection from this kind of uh, medicine. When you start seeing more, though, it's very difficult to find, uh, uh, to draw a line below which human rights are violated, violated uh, above which Human rights are no longer violated. Uh, so, moreover, as I said, human rights intuitively are not rights to a good life, but to a decent one. But who is to say what decency for an entity endowed with agency requires? So that's the first problem of Griffin that Griffin has, even if he no longer focuses on agency per se, as Gayworth used to do. Another problem with agency-based accounts is that when we think that torture violates human rights, we don't think that the wrong done to the victim has exclusively and perhaps even primarily to do with the deprivation of the victim's agency. I mean, what's wrong with torture is the pain uh, that you uh, cause to the victim. It's not the fact that you uh, make him or her less as an agent as it used to be. So, the problem with torture is not that you cannot move or that you are no longer the master of your life. The problem with torture is the pain that the victim suffers. And pain has really nothing to do with agency. Uh, is, it, it relates to, uh, to the protection of, of other things uh, that are important for human beings that uh, do not seem to have a lot to do with agency. Uh, we think that the part, part, at least part of the wrong uh, of torture has to do with the pain that the victim suffers. Finally, that's the third and final main problem with agency-based accounts, they seem to be committed to the bizarre view that children or mentally impaired people are not entitled to human rights. That's the usual criticism that is raised against Kantian ethics. If you make everything dependent on reason, if you think that the, the basis of human dignity is reason, what do we do with children or with mentally impaired people that no longer or still do not have or no longer have uh, their full rational capacities? Uh, in this case, the this objection is translated um, in, the, in the language of agency, agency-based uh, arguments. Since the capacity for proposing action for agency of these categories of people is either not yet developed or permanently lost, it seems to follow that they do not have human rights. And this would be a very bizarre conclusion because, of course, children are the quintessential elements that need protection, the protection that human rights uh, perform. Um, and of course, morality, not only morality, but the law in general attributes human rights to these people. Okay, that's the first of the three orientations within instrumentalism. Another instrumentalist account suggests that a plurality of good, as I said, not only one, not only agency, um, as in the agency-based account, lies at the foundation of human rights. So, for example, John Finnis, neo-scholastic scholar, suggested an allegedly objective list of human goods, <coughs> life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, sociability, friendship, practical, reasonableness, and religion, seek, I had to seek, <laughs> because it's not a mistake, <laughs> he, he thinks that religion is uh, one of the human goods human rights should 
protected by other groups. What he means is freedom to exercise your religion or to think that it's not is necessary it, to have a religion. Is it the whole list? Life? Yeah, the that's the list he okay. has. Life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, sociability. Well, it's not very different from the list that Nussbaum, Nussbaum has. I mean, she also has a list of capabilities uh, that are uh, important for her. I mean, that she thinks are important for everybody. Um, and Nigel, James Nigel, the, the founder, as I told you, of the philosophy of human rights, also adopts a pluralist perspective and argues that human rights secure and are thereby justified by four goods, life, the steering of one life, if you want freedom, in the common sensible uh, way of understanding freedom, avoidance of cruel and degrading treatment, and avoidance of severely unfair treatment. So notice uh, the point about torture. Uh, he makes the avoidance of cruel treatment as a distinct good from the steering of one's life, which allows you to say, okay, yeah, torture is a violation of human rights because, uh, not because it violates agency, but because it violates this other important good that I have listed, so the avoidance of extremely cruel treatment. Uh, okay, so, also the editors of this ex excellent collection of assets that I gave to you, Kruf, uh, Liao, and Renzo, um, are kind of instrumentalist, uh, and also included in the instrumentalist family the position of John Tasiulas, I told you, the, the, the philosopher who probably uh, spent most of his uh, time speaking of human rights, he had, he's the director of a center at King's College now, um, and uh, basically he talks with you about human rights only. Um, and uh, so, John Tasulas uh, expands the list of goods protected by human rights to a known, uh, the known uh, prefixed and determinate list of things that benefit humans. So he thinks, yes, human rights are about protecting goods that are important for human beings. Fine. But I'm not going to say which the goods uh, are. Um, I'm only giving you uh, a constraint, uh, a condition to uh, make a certain good a good that should be protected by human rights. What is this constraint? What is this condition? Now, the constraint is that establishing that there is a human right to X should not impose excessive burdens on the corresponding duty bearers. So, if you introduce a human right to a uh, holiday with pay for each and every human being, this is going probably to cost a lot of taxes uh, to afford uh, all uh, holidays we pay for to every human being on earth that are excessive on people who work uh, uh, or perhaps they would uh, destroy the economy because the taxes would be too high and therefore you no longer have an efficient economy because people no longer are motivated to work if they have to give 80% of their income well, then it's better to wait for the for the subsistence of the state and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to give you an example of uh, a good which is certainly something that everybody wants that should not be made a human, into a human right because the cost of providing that good is too high for those who are, have to pay to offer that kind of good. Whereas the right to vote is not something that it, you know, has a cost on, uh, uh, on other people, and you may think that having a, a decent healthcare system is costly, but not too costly uh, for other people to provide. So, um, 
for of course, yes. There are different kinds of human rights. Some are stronger than others. Third, holiday. For example? Have a holiday. Uh huh. I'm thinking about the Norberto Baldwin and Michelle Pili. And for example, Norberto Baldwin says about his different kinds of rights, and we shall believe uh, says that the human rights promise a lot, and it, it's this like, abstract, and they are very, um, that uh, it, there is a critic about this, this thing, and I'd like to say what your opinion about this, uh, this, this writer is. Right. No, no, it's an excellent point. Um, this is usually called the you know, in, inflationary tendency of human rights. They, they tend to grow. We have four generations of human rights. We add human rights. We have been adding human rights since the beginning through different generations of human rights. We, the fourth generation of human rights are human rights of the environment, not of people living in the environment, of the environment itself. So we keep adding human rights uh, and there is a problem of inflation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated story because I also think that there are certain, well, you can have a three-fold distinction or maybe four-fold distinction. You may think that there are things that are to be considered human rights and things that are not to be considered human rights. In the things that are not to be considered human rights, you may include uh, provisions, goods that are protected by liberal democracies. So, for example, we all think that if you live in a liberal democracy, you uh, have the right to be treated as an equal, perfectly, at least from a formal point of view, in as an equal to all other citizens. Many philosophers, John Rawls and his followers, think that human rights should not protect you from some form of discrimination, such as if you do not belong to the mainstream uh, uh, culture, or the mainstream religion, you should be given exactly the same political rights as other people. They think that um, Democracy is not a human right. Uh, perfect equality before the law is not a human right. Of course, there are. They think that you cannot go before a, a judge and be treated uh, unfairly simply because you are not part of the main community or of the, of the main religious group or stuff like that. No, of course, that's a human right. But when we talk about perfect equality, many people think it should not be conceived as a human right. So, you may have things that are protected in liberal democracies but should not be protected by, by human rights. Then, within what you may think are human rights, uh, there are things that uh, may be considered as more important than others. So, for example, the violation of some human rights, many people think, could be legitimate ground for intervention and violence uh, on the part of other states to stop a certain government to violate those subs that subset of human rights. So for example, we are not going to talk about the relationship between human rights and the humanitarian intervention, but the main uh, text about humanitarian intervention today is the so-called responsibility to protect that is a text available on internet that sets the conditions uh, on which the international community is not just allowed but kind of required to act against the government even using military force in the case of the violation of certain rights, certain human rights, which are genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, crimes against humanity and another one that I forgot. So 
um, these human rights are really the most important, if you want, the most urgent. The, those that, if violated, legitimize uh, uh, breach of national sovereignty up to the point of a military intervention. Then, below, there are other things that are still human rights, but perhaps justify not uh, such a strong interference, but simply a moral condemnation. So imagine the Secretary General of the United Nations that says, Italy, it's not okay the way you run your prisons. We are not going to invade you for that. But still, I have the right to criticize, criticize you, not as an individual, but as the representative of the international community, to tell you, no, that is wrong. And I don't care if, you know, I'm talking about something that happens within your national territory, it's still wrong. So, you may have a, an articulation of different categories of human rights uh, made according to the legitimate response that the international community may have in case in which these different categories are violated. Um, so, uh, one of the problems, I don't know if I answered your question or if, you know, if it helps, but one of the problems, it's good because it, it allows me to say what's the main problem with Casula's suggestion of leaving this list of goods open with the only constraints it should not be too costly for the duty bearers. To me, I mean, when he came to Catania, I asked precisely this same question, he wasn't very shocked by it, but literally this means that if we are smart enough, I have a, a student who is writing a dissertation on work, she thinks that the quality of work, not whether you have a job or you don't have a job, but the quality of the job that you have, is something that has been uh, wrongly left outside of the concern of justice. So justice is about distribution of goods, but nobody thinks uh, that justice should also say something about the quality of the job that you do. At most, those who think that the quality of the job matters is going to tell you that you have to be compensated with more money if you do a dirty job or if you do something that is not as good as